Okay, hi students. So this is going to be kind of a short video showing um, an example presentation. Uh, this is actually a presentation I gave um, a few years ago at a scientific congress and it's basically showing the results from a study did that then was published as well. So um, it's, uh, it's an older presentation that I did, so it's not perfect in any way. Uh, but it's a good example of kind of the flow. And so I'll give the presentation all at once. And then what I'll do is um, stop. I'll, I'll go back to some slides and just point out a few things that you might do and point out some flaws in my slide that maybe you can improve. Okay, so, so here we go. So this is like starting it when you give your presentation. Hi, so I decided to uh, study the Paleoptera which are a group of insects that have wings, but they are very ancient insects. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And so I um, started this project thinking about um, how are the earliest insects that have wings related, okay? And when you think about winged insects, there are essentially three main lineages. There's the lineage of the damselflies and dragonflies, these top two. Damselflies, by the way, they're the smaller ones. They're more gracile and they hold their wings over their back when they land. And then dragonflies are the larger ones and they hold their wings straight out to the side. Uh, mayflies, which are the ephemeroptera, this, this name here in yellow. And mayflies also, when they land, their wings go up above them. But notice that neither of these groups have the ability to fold their wings up and then lay their wings kind of like flat over their abdomen. That was an ability that was gained in the lineage called Neoptera or new wing. So Paleoptera means old wing and Neoptera new wing. And a good example of a folded wing would be like this grasshopper here where it can fold its wings up and lay them flat over the top of its, of its abdomen. Okay, so there are these three lineages and then, of course, prior to this, there are insects that never have had wings, okay? And so the idea is I want to investigate, the objective of this study is to investigate what is the relationship of these three lineages. Now, there is evidence um, that Ephemeroptera and Odonata should be grouped together in a group called the Paleoptera, or these, this old wing notation. And therefore, what you have is you have a Neoptera being sister to the Paleoptera. And this is some; of, these are some of the studies that support this uh, this relationship. There also, though, is morphological evidence to support the idea of a Ephemeroptera sister to the Neoptera plus Odonata. Sometimes this is referred to as the basal Ephemeroptera hypothesis or the Metaterygota because Neoptera plus Odonata is, is the name, has the name Metaterygota. And here are some of the, the, the morphological characteristics that support that arrangement. The third option is that you have Odonata as sister to the Ephemeroptera plus the Neoptera. So this is sometimes called the basal Odonata hypothesis or the Chiastomeria hypothesis because Neoptera plus Ephemeroptera equals Chiastomeria. And there are a few uh, um, morphological characters that also support this relationship. So this was the issue is which of these three arrangements is correct? Well, for molecular data, um, going back to the late 1990s, you started to get a few analyses that started to generate a single gene or two, two gene uh, data sets that started to look at the relationships of these organisms. And some of the analyses and some of the genes supported the monophyletic Paleoptera hypothesis. Other analyses supported the basal ephemeroptera hypothesis and other analyses supported the basal odonata hypothesis. So just as we saw with morphological data, it really depended on 
which morphology you were looking at, you would then get support for any one of the three hypotheses. The same thing started to occur with molecular data and not just like which gene were you looking at, but how did you analyze that gene also seemed to make a difference. And so you had these, these uh, different hypotheses that were competing and it was a real conundrum. And this is sometimes called the paleoptera problem. And so in, uh, as I'm doing my PhD work, I come across this paper and I, you know, it was like, oh, I just got scooped because this uh, author, Hofmuller, pub published this paper called The Paleopter Problem, looking at the basal pterygoat phylogeny inferred from 18S and 28S. And basically their conclusion was the monophyletic paleoptera. And it was one of the most complete uh, data sets that had been constructed to the time. But I had been working on this problem as well. And my data set actually that I had at the time was even bigger than theirs. I just hadn't published it yet. Now, if we look at their data set, remember they had 18S and then they had partial 28S. So just a small thing of the, of the 28S. And, they did, and what I did is I looked at all of their data. And I looked at their data using different gap opening gap extension costs and different ways of treating the fifth state character. In other words, letting gaps have, uh, you know, have weight in the analysis or to not be counted in the analysis. So you can see the different gap openings here. And then uh, where I left gap extension as one or did I leave, let the gap opening equal the gap extension. And then also treating things with a gap as a question mark or treating gaps as a fifth state character. Whoops. Now, as you can see, a lot of the time, the result from these analyses showed that the tree was unresolved. In other words, that's where you have kind of the tritomy. There's no support for any one of the hypotheses. But sometimes you would get support for any one of the hypotheses. For example, you can see when, when gaps were uh, treated as a missing character and when it was gap extension of one uh, uh, for, all gap, for any kind of gap opening cost, most of the time you were getting kind of this support for Paleoptera. Right? But you could see as you changed this, you got support for both the od odonata, basal odonata hypothesis and the basal ephemeroptera hypothesis. So I basically concluded that that data that was done by Hofmuller, um, even though they thought that they were making a conclusion that seemed, to, that seemed well supported, it turned out as soon as you changed the alignment parameters that you got different answers. So... I then produced my own analysis and published it, and it was published in Cladistics. It's called The Problem with the Paleopter Problem, Sense and Sensitivity. And what I did was an analysis with um, a bunch of outgroups. I did 23 species of, of mayflies and 21 species of dragonflies and damselflies, and then, a, and then a bunch of polyneoptera. So these are the things that are representing the lineage neoptera. I used, again, 18S DNA, but I also then used the complete D, uh, 28S gene region, and I added a new gene, H3 nuclear protein coding. So for my analysis, I used three genes. You guys are only having to use two genes for your analyses. And because this was an important paper too, I also used a morphological data set. You're not required to do that, but I used a morphological data set as well. So the methods that I used were parsimony and likelihood. Within parsimony, I would do TBR with 1,000 a a random additions. We ran bootstrap analyses on these things. We treated gaps as a fifth state character. We also looked at different gap costs during alignment and different data set combinations. So if we just analyze 18S by itself or together with 28S or whatever. And uh, then I also did a likelihood, and after we ran a model test, it was determined that GTR plus I plus G was the best model, and so that's what we used. And the results show this. So the gene 18S, when it's analyzed in parsimony, showed a basal odonata. Now the numbers in green are my bootstrap values. So you can see there is a, uh, a 91... Uh, 
percent bootstrap value that all of these lineages should be together. We probably would have expected that to be a little bit higher. There's 100% bootstrap that the dragonflies and damselflies are monophyletic, 100% bootstrap that the mayflies are monophyletic, only a 78% bootstrap that the Neoptera should be monophyletic. That one we would have expected to be higher too. But this is the real important one is this 51. There's a really low confidence that the Neoptera plus Ephemeroptera is the best arrangement here. Nevertheless, the conclusion from this one gene is Basilodonata. If we look at 28S, remember this is a, long, a longer gene, look at my bootstraps now, 100% across everything with basal ephemeroptera as the um, hypothesis that is best supported. If we do just molecular data, so this is now 18S plus 28S plus, plus the H3 gene, all three genes, then we also get a tree that has 100% bootstrap values across all the nodes of interest and it now, though, re supports a different conclusion. The monophyletic paleoptera is now supported. So at this point, you know, you start pulling your hair out. Maybe some of this is happening to some of you. When we did a total evidence analysis, including all of the genes plus the morphology, once again, we get the basal ephemeroptera hypothesis as the most well-supported hypothesis. So here's kind of a summary of other analyses that were done, okay? So those are the main ones, but here's others that we did. We did a gap cost to transversion to transition ratio. So the first number is the gap um, cost. How costly is it to put in a gap? The next number is the transversion, and then the last one's the transition. And what we see is when you treat these things differently, you get different support for each of the different three hypotheses. We also saw, once again, we already saw this one, that likelihood supported basal ephemeroptera. Um, parsimony supported this monophyletic paleoptera. Don't worry about metapiga. That was a different analysis I did. And um, the different genes, as we already saw, were also supporting different hypotheses here. Morphology was even supporting different things. But when we did the total evidence analysis, it did support the basal ephemeroptera. So even though I'm not extremely confident, I am somewhat confident that the basal ephemeroptera perhaps was the best conclusion given these data. So why even care? I mean, why make such a fuss about whether it's basal ephemeroptera, basal odonata, or whatever? Well, it's because I'm interested in how wings evolved. And we know that wings evolved prior to the origination of these three lineages. And so what I want to do is figure out which lineage is the best one to study. And so uh, if it's mayflies as the basal lineage, let me go back. If mayflies are the basal lineage, then the, like, if this is the answer, then we ought to spend a lot more time learning about the biology of ephemeroptera and the genetics of ephemeroptera in order to understand the evolution of flight. If odonata is the, uh, basal odonata is the correct hypothesis, same thing, we ought to spend more time maybe looking at odonata. And if it's monophyletic paleoptera, then we probably ought to spend an equal amount of time, or at least we ought to look into both odonata and ephemeroptera. Uh, by the way, as more and more data has come out, it seems like probably monophyletic paleoptera is the uh, correct um, hypothesis. However, we're still unsure about that, and I'm actually working on a, on a study with a colleague up at BYU, and we're gonna be looking at this. So, my conclusions. First, the current suite of molecular data ambiguously resolve the three basal winged insect lineage. I don't think we can call uh, are the, and when I say current suite, I meant back in 2003 when this was published, but that those two genes, there or those three genes ambiguously resolve um, the relationships of these lineages. As soon as we included the morphology though, it seemed uh, that there was quite good support for basal ephemeroptera. So those are my main conclusions from this. And you can see I didn't do anything grand here, and so you can kind of, that's where you can stop, is just kind of have conclusions like that, that's fine. I just want to do a quick interjection here. Uh, I probably did a much longer presentation than I should have. Remember, I've told you guys, try to keep it around 10 minutes. Um, if you're less than 10 minutes, that's fine, but as soon as you start going over 10 minutes, it's a little too long. I went, looks like I ran maybe about 14 minutes there, so that was too long, so keep it around 10. And there are all my references, and these are examples of how you might format your references as well. Notice it's, it, they're formatted just like they would be in a um, scientific paper. 
So that's how I don't want, you know, just a website that that's not good enough. If you include the website, um, the DOI number as a hyperlink at the end of your reference, that's okay, but don't just put the website or even don't just put the DOI number. So this is an example of what maybe it ought to look like, something like that. Usually you organize it by uh, alphabetically and, um, and so go ahead and look at that if you want to. Okay, so that kind of takes me to the end of the presentation. Let me go back now to the beginning and just go through some of these slides and things that I might have done better that I can see are problems now. Um, the title is okay, it's not great, probably, but it's fun to have kind of a fun title, you know? Don't just say phylogeny of, I mean, if it's okay, that's fine if you just have phylogeny of, you know, um, big cats. But it's kind of fun to have a title. I like using um, the colon where it's like, you know, are big cats monophyletic? Colon phylogeny of felidae, you know, something like that. I, I like those better than others. Um, make sure your images are nice and clean. Notice this image of the dra dragonfly here is it terrible. It's all pixelated. It's not any good. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of good pictures of dragonflies. Why have I, I have included that one is beyond me. I think it was because I was trying to be fancy with getting rid of the background so that it looked just like the insect on the, uh, you know, with no background behind it, but I don't know. But it's nice to have maybe an image, you know, at the beginning of your slide. Make sure and put your name as well. Um, I put biology major, but you know, you don't need to do that. If you want to put one of the tags of the, or one of the images of the Utah Valley University, that's fine too. You know, during your introduction, you could say introduction at the top, but give a little bit of introduction. And in the, in the introduction is a good time to really have some really good pictures too, right? Show us the taxa that you're interested in. Talk about their biology maybe for a little bit. You know, I, I could have done that a little bit more, but I, I did talk quite a bit about this whole wing issue. And that's what the whole point of why I was trying to get to this, right? And so, you know, you'd want to kind of bookend your story where you have things at the beginning that are interesting and then you bring those back at the end after you get your results. Um, I did a really good job, I think, at showing kind of the previous work that had been done. And, and this is what, I mean, I don't know how much you guys have done, but you should do quite a bit of literature review so that you tell us about what was already known about this group. And it's okay if there are studies that are much more recent than what your study is even looking at. That's fine, it's not, that's, that's, that's not a big deal, okay? Just you want to show to me that you, you've done your research and that you're setting this question up properly. So that's what I did through these slides, okay? Um, and now this dragonfly doesn't look so bad down here because it's much smaller. When it was bigger, it looked worse, but now it kind of makes sense. Notice how I've used color coding throughout. Uh, that's always a really nice way to set aside and keep people on track with what, which group you're talking about is to like denominate a color for a certain lineage that you're going to be interested in. All right, work through those. Um, you can put pictures of previous papers if you want. That's, that was my own preference. You don't need to do that. <coughs> um, again, I'm using the same color schemes here. You don't need to do anything this in depth. If you tried to do this many analyses, you'd probably drive yourself crazy. I just did it, and so I showed you it, but don't worry about that. This is an important slide. You know, a, a slide that basically shows your, uh, your whole data set. And if you want, you could kind of even march through this a little bit slower and show pictures of each one of these, of these organisms if you want. Like if you've got a bunch of different big cats or cat, different kinds of cats, you know, you could have a bunch of pictures here. I've got more just representatives of each one of these major lineages here, but you know, you could have done something better than what I did. I think a lot of these pictures are actually pretty poor and, and uh, not well done at all. So if I could go back, I'd probably change these pictures quite a bit. I'd probably change the introduce this and maybe have this be one slide and then maybe do a different slide with the genes. But I just did it all in one slide here and uh, you know, you should tell us about which genes you chose and so forth. You could have maybe a table that shows how everything fits out there. I don't know, whatever you wanna do. Uh, and then you should have a slide that talks about your methods. Notice I didn't go into too many details here, but enough that gave me some hints and reminders to let me talk about this a little bit. And that's fine if you do that. Like if you say more than what's on your slide, that's usually better than just reading your slide. Like reading your slide's boring, so don't just do that. But 
but you know, have a slide with your methods. You could talk about your uh, alignment and your phylogenetic reconstruction. You could talk about, you know, did you use a model test to determine which model you got? You know, anything you want to put on there might be a good idea. Um, and then I just walked you through the results here, right? Uh, something, you know, that maybe I would have done is, you know, how I wanted to point out this 51 node. I could have had like a big arrow pointing to this or maybe had this circle with an animation that came in or something. Maybe something better to point it out. Um, although, you know, I was kind of giving the presentation so I could use my mouse to do that. So that was okay. So we just worked through the different ones. I think that was fine. This slide, just because I did a lot of different analysis, is kind of impressive, but you don't need to have anything like that at all either. And then, you know, this is where I've now brought it back, and so I, I closed the story. So what is it about this? Why do we even care? Well, remember, we were interested in how, fly, you know, wings came about. So I've kind of brought the story all, all the way back around. And then, you know, make sure and have your conclusion slides. And I really only had these two basic conclusions. And, you know, that's fine, whatever you have. And you can, um, but you should remind and always come back to your conclusions. And then you can just, you don't need to even talk about your references cited. You can um, go ahead and, uh, you know, have that there because I want to look at your references cited. So if you don't, you don't need to like talk about these. You can just get, have, this, have that stuck on the end if you want. Um, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Oh, and you can have an acknowledgments and thank you slide as well, or thank you slide. But please don't acknowledge me, okay? You can acknowledge, you know, other people, but I'm your instructor. I was here to help you, so don't, don't worry about acknowledging me. If you did do a, uh, an analysis where um, you generated data and you got funding to generate that data, you for sure need to acknowledge the, any funding agencies. Um, but that's kind of how you do an acknowledgement slide, so that's fine too. All right. And that's, that's it. That's what I would uh, have you guys do. Let me know if you have any other questions, and I'd be happy to answer those or make another video.